My ex-boyfriend was a Craigslist horror story. I moved back and felt lonely, so I decided to try dating. I created a few profiles and started talking to people. We began talking, and eventually, he and I started dating. There were a few things off about him, which later turned out to be because he was an alcoholic and was drunk more often than I realized. After dating for nine months, I was taking photos with his phone, and then I went to delete them, only to find a MySpace boob shot from some other girl. He swears he wasn't cheating on me, but we ended up breaking up. Then we got back together, sort of, but not really, and he got upset when I started looking for other people. He tried to trick my dating profile. I told him to never talk to me again. He then tried to invite me to a college grad party, but I didn't read the email, and my work kind of told him not to go there. I received a weird complaint at the ambulance service where I work about me. The company warned me about it, but they didn't take it seriously because it was anonymous and included my first and last name a weird Polish name that is very uncommon, even in Poland, which is not on my uniform. They also claimed the company had been around for a long time when it was founded less than six months prior. There was no proof it was him. He then sent me an anonymous birthday card, which was creepy and special ordered too. Later, he decided to show up to a gas leak at the fire department. The chief called the cops to ask him to leave because he waited at the gas leak for over five hours. This started a huge issue. He initially friended a lot of people on Facebook that I talked to, so I think he had access to mine, probably a saved password by accident. We're talking about the guy I was going on dates with and people from firefighting class, but not the people I text. He also called the cops and wanted his stuff back, but the cops told him, lol, out of luck because he filed a complaint that the fire department and police department molested him when they asked him to leave. Keep in mind he is starting the police academy in a few months. He then tried to tell sob stories to my co-workers and best friends who were kind of like, F off, dude. One even told him that, like my best friend from when I was in kindergarten. He then posted on Missed Connections my name, my last initial, my age, and the area I live in, attempting to contact me. He even posted trying to contact the guy I was dating. Anyway, I got weirded out and broke things off with my current boyfriend. He continued to post a lot. Eventually, I started dating a cop who is out of state, who ended things by basically threatening to get him arrested. I told him not to. I was 21 and I wanted to take a trip from Santa Cruz, California to Olympia, Washington. Since I was fairly broke at the time, I decide to check Craigslist for a rideshare. I find a ride with a guy whose ad mentions that he might like to stop at some swimming holes or hot springs along the way. This should have been a red flag, but I thought nothing of it. He was in his 40s and seemed nice, but also a bit strange. I insisted that we pick up a couple who was hitchhiking, because I felt more comfortable with the additional company. After we dropped off the couple somewhere in the Central Valley, things start to get weird he pulls off the highway at what he called a great swimming spot. In reality, it was more of an irrigation canal with a stand of trees nearby. I sit down in the shade and have a snack. Suddenly, the guy is bare-ass naked. He stands in front of me asking me to join in and go skinny dipping with him. I wasn't having any part of it, so I refuse and he proceeds to swim. This was the first of multiple times that I saw this guy naked during our road trip. After hours of driving, and at least one other swimming stop, we go to an old roadside saloon for dinner and beer. I thought about leaving him at that point, but decided not to since it was night, and we were in the middle of nowhere in Oregon. After a bit more driving, he decides that he's too tired to keep driving, and doesn't want me to drive his car. So he parks and makes up a bed in the back of the station wagon, he's naked again of course. I'm staying in the front seat, and he wants me to come sleep with him in the back. He basically propositions me to have sex with him, and sweetens the pot by telling me we wouldn't need protection due to his vasectomy. I stay in the front and don't sleep a wink. Next morning as we pull into Olympia, his car is acting weird or breaking down. He's asking me if he can stay at my friend's place while he figures it out. I'm like nope I call my friend to pick me up and get the F away from this guy. What should have been a 14-15 hour trip was over 24 hours. That was the last time I did a CL rideshare. A few weeks ago, I bought a used computer over Craigslist. Terrible idea, I know, but 
but it went surprisingly well. He did warn me that he didn't know how to format the hard drive, which seemed odd to me since he looked like he was in his 50s. So I've been spending the past few days poring through this guy's files, mostly work documents and the occasional saved email attachment, except for this folder named Diary, which has these weird stories. Fiction I'm guessing more like hoping. Anyway, I've been a fan of Nasleep for quite a while now, and I decided to share these with you. If I get a great response, I'll upload the rest using this throwaway account. Seriously, there's a lot of these. Enjoy. 16. February 2007. Part 1. Fantasy. It was warm at first. Comforting. Like the hug of a mother consoling a child after she dropped her ice cream. It's soft, reassuring, as if everything is as right as rain. You want that feeling to last forever. Then it became warmer, intense, like the feeling in your chest when you see your crush. It's intoxicating, this particular combination of pleasure and pain. It starts in the center of your body and continues to spread, permeating into every cell of your body until you're powerless to defend against it and unwillingly surrender yourself to its power. To continue to intensify, with each breath, with each rise and fall of the chest it became more and more real, until time ceased to exist. Then he heard the screaming. It was loud, oddly strained, as if it were being tortured for hours, past the point of no return. The warmth started spreading down to his legs, igniting the tiny hairs on his calves, sending small wisps of smoke up into the air. It gripped at the bottom of his feet, making every nerve of his body shudder with pain. With every second that passed, he could feel less of himself, as if his body was breaking apart in a slow progressive rhythm like the leaves of fall. He looked down. The warmth was visible now. Tall, bright flames devouring every inch of his body. The screaming became louder by the second, almost deafening. It began to crawl up to his neck, slowly like the tongue of a fierce lover. The flames came to rest on his face, as gently as a friendly peck on the cheek, burning holes through the skin of his face and into the exposed flesh underneath. Then the bitch woke him up. She had a bra on today, must be another job interview. No, wait. She's wearing sneakers. Parents in town. Damn. That means I'll have to be nice to him today. No more weird shit. He got up and stared himself in the bathroom mirror. I always hated the way he kept his hair. Long oily locks dangling down to his neck. He always refused to cut it, no matter how many times I wet the bed or threw up. Idiot. It must be the pills kicking in. It's getting harder for him to do what I want him to do. It's not impossible, just harder. But I like the fact that he thinks he's got control over me. It's cute. Call it placebo, snake oil, whatever. She made some food for a change. Obviously he refused to eat anything, not after that dream. No food, no pills. You have a long night ahead of you, eat something before you pass out again. I told her to go F herself. She didn't even blink, I loved that about her. Past tense of course. Seriously, we're only going to be back next morning, eat up. The idiot decided to eat after all. No worries, I'll make him throw it up later on. Provided I stay alive long enough. She offered to drive. Guess she still doesn't trust me to drive after I tried to kill him. Her tan thighs gleamed through her short skirt in the moonlight, like popsicles threatening to melt. He fidgeted with his nails, it was driving me insane. The expressway had more traffic than usual, odd for this time of day. Worthless corporate suits milling around in their big cars compensating for their penises, wasting perfectly good oxygen to satisfy nothing but their wallets and self-interests. I love those guys. Makes me feel good about myself. She took the next right into the city. Recession left thousands of corporations to implement budget cuts on their construction schemes, leaving this part of the city modeled after a cell block. Three cells over was that asshole's office. She signed in at the gate and paid the guard. Wow, they expect people to pay by the hour and for parking. Genius. Waiting rooms always present the opportunity to mess with him. Whether it's the boredom or the usual torture that follows these sessions, I don't know, but it's much more entertaining in a room where even the slightest of sounds guarantees every other person's eyes on him, judging him, thinking he must be just another lunatic. Almost as if he heard me, he downed a couple more pills. I could feel myself being pushed back, slowly, towards the back of his head. This is great, I deserve a rest once in a while too, after being kept up all day, making him dream of burning flesh, harder than it looks.
I was selling my old Volvo's 40, and this guy messaged me to meet up for a showcase. I was quite broke at the moment and was giving quite a bargain as the car was performing well for its mileage. The guy shows up. I show him the car, we chat a little, and he goes, All right, the car is nice and the offer seems fair, I just gotta check with my dad about the money. I'm like, all right, take your time. He then proceeds to make a call and 15 minutes later his father comes, greets me and pulls him away for a talk. Then I hear some screaming and I turn around to see the guy being beaten up with jumper cables by his old dude. I got in the car and bolted away lightning fast. About a year has passed and I have not yet heard from the guy. Shut up. I yelled as I groggily awoke and swatted my alarm clock off of my nightstand. I swung my body around, took my blanket off, and planted my feet on the ground. I picked up the alarm clock and set it back in its place and proceeded to start my day. I had just moved into this house. It's a quiet little thing in the middle of a small town in Nebraska. I'm from Manhattan so I stick out like a sore thumb around here with my accent. I started my day as follows. I made some breakfast, watched CNN for a bit, then hopped on my PC to check my emails, Skype, and look at the front page of the internet. Google. I stared at the Google logo while my Pop-Tarts were in the toaster. I heard the ding and lifted myself up to go get my food. I ate the two rectangles of deliciousness and headed back into my room to get dressed. The house is a one-story house with a basement and a small attic. I only moved some furniture in as I had just moved out of my parents' house a week or two ago and didn't have much of my own. After I got dressed and watched some video of a black guy getting beat by a cop on CNN, I went back to my laptop. I decided I'd look around for some furniture as my old job had just paid me my last paycheck. I only had about one $500 to spare right now, so I decided to opt for a sofa or a kitchen table or something. I looked on Google Maps for a furniture store, but the closest one was over 70 miles away. Not wanting to pay out the ass for gas money or overpriced furniture, I took a look on eBay and Craigslist. After browsing on Craigslist for a bit, I found a really nice leather sofa and coffee table that was listed for one $900. I figured it was a good deal as they both seemed to be in good condition. I contacted the seller by email inquiring about the sofa and table. Not even five minutes later, I got a reply. He said it'd just be easier to call, so he gave me his phone number. The number was 531-966-6205. A bit unsettling, yes. I didn't even notice it at first since I was so tired, but me being the way I am would have stopped dead in my tracks right there. I seriously regret only have slept three hours that past night, but I couldn't really have avoided it. I had jet lag and shit. I called him and he told me the usual stuff. Oh, it's comfortable, good condition, and blah blah etc. He told me his name was John. I replied with my name, and he returned with his address. He said he was in a neighborhood that was just 20 or so miles from me. There was no real public place to meet so I was forced to make this 20 mile trip to his house. I've heard all the Craigslist horror stories, but I'm a big guy 6 foot 4 and about 200 pounds. I could take anyone on in a fight as long as it isn't some big Malinian or Russian dude. I grabbed a water bottle, my phone, keys and headed out the door. I plugged the address into Google Maps and set my phone on the dashboard and I was off. I have a red 1998 Ford F-150 so hauling this thing shouldn't have been any issue, although I didn't have any rope with me to tie the thing down. I got closer to the guy's address, and with every mile, houses got sparser and sparser. I ended up in a town called Lil. It had no police department, no library, no anything. Just some rundown shacks where you'd probably find some meth addicts. I was about a half a mile away at this point. Wondering if I had taken a wrong turn, I pulled over at a little gas station. A lady, who appeared to be in her 40s or 50s, walked up to my window. I slowly turned my head around. F me seven dollars. That's what this old bat shirt said. I turned my head back around, put my phone down in the cup holder, and slowly drove back the way I came. I whipped around the gas station and drove up another small road. I heard the GPS say, rerouting, and I continued along with my trek in that piece of shit town. About a minute later, I came up to a small, bluish-gray house set back a ways in the woods. This was number 51, my destination. I parked on the street about 100 feet from the house. The house, while all others looked like they went through a nuclear holocaust, was in fairly good condition. 
Other than some of the siding coming off, it looked inhabited. It had a blue 22 or 23 Nissan out front and a detached garage. I trotted up to the front door, trying to not trip on any of the cracked steps. The first thing I noticed was that the door was slightly cracked open and had small amount of blood right above the doorknob. I froze for a second. Okay, I said to myself, I'm getting the F out of here. I started to briskly walk to my car. Unbeknownst to me, there was someone in or around the house. I wish I could say it was a serial killer, or a rapist, or even a six-legged monster. But no. Hey! A little voice from behind yelled out. Wah bam! Total blackness. I jumped, waking from a sleep with my entire body shaking. I looked around and saw black, and black, and black, and black. That's all I saw while slowly scanning the room. At first I thought I was dead and in purgatory or something. I wasn't exactly far off with that guess. I heard a switch flip on from my right side, then the hiss of some fluorescent lights above me. The first thing I did was look down to shield my eyes from the light, but I couldn't move for some reason. I was in a chair and I was strapped to the thing. I saw an X or something below my feet. Well, at least I thought it was. I started to panic. I looked all around and wiggled in the chair, all while screaming totally uncontrollably and almost tipping myself over. Mother F, I yelled outwards. I was going nuts, more nuts than Nicolas Cage would have been in my situation. Where the F am I? Hello? Hello? I was really starting to panic. I could feel the anxiety kicking in, my heart palpitating, sweat flowing down my head and around my eye sockets, my legs starting to cramp. I was literally stuck in the worst position you could be in. All of the sudden, from behind me, six or seven silhouettes appeared. The fluorescent lights were still warming up so they were dim, but the figures all moved in unison, creating a circle around me. I could now see a red pentagram on the floor. It wasn't just a harmless X, but a giant red pentagram, and I was in its center. I was almost on the brink of tears. Then the lights went off again. Each of the figures, again in unison, pulled out a match or something from their dark robes and struck them at the same time. The amount of harmony these things acted in almost had me in awe. They bent down and lit a candle in between their feet. The two figures who weren't standing at one of the ends of the shape on the floor slowly approached me. They also moved in unison, taking big steps, their bodies swaying, coming closer and closer. My heart was in my feet and throat at the same time. I couldn't breathe. At this point I was just about in a panic attack. I could feel my lungs pushing all of the air out of my body involuntarily. I was crying. Then these two figures were now next to me, one on each side. I was screaming, crying, yelling and thrashing. The figure on my left removed his hood and slowly walked over to my knees. He put his hands on my knees as the other figure walked behind me with a roll of tape in hand. The figure sealed my mouth shut, put a bag over my head and started moving the chair forwards. They had me moving for ten or so seconds. The chair stopped moving. I could feel them walking around me. I'm not sure what they were doing, but it didn't seem like much. Eventually, one of them took the bag off of my head. I was in a smaller pentagram now, and looking around I could see lit and unlit candles littered everywhere over the floor. I looked up. My eyes almost popped out of my head. There was a big owl statue made out of wood in front of me. I recognized immediately what it was. It was an owl named Moloch whom the fags at Bohemian Grove basically worship. I know this from being a long listener of Alex Jones, he'd always talk about it on his radio show, explaining how it's connected to the Illuminati and the elitists who control our government. I figured this was a cremation of care ceremony, but I clearly was not in a redwood forest, but more of a small warehouse of sorts. I still knew that one way or another, I was about to get sacrificed to this thing. I was shitting myself, screaming with the tape stuck across my mouth. I need to stop for a second. I'm getting anxiety just writing about this. I saw a psychologist and he told me I likely have post-traumatic stress disorder and referred me to a psychiatrist for medication. They've got me prescribed to medication like a zombie, but I refuse to take it. But enough of talking about that. Back to my involuntary sacrifice. I've just got to take some deep breaths first. So anyway, I'm in the chair in front of Moloch. The five figures whom at this point I knew had to be some freaks in a cult, walked up to Moloch in their fashionable dark robes. They all took their hoods off and kneeled to the statue, slowly bowing their torsos up and down. At this point, I knew I was totally messed up. 
I could see that the two guys standing next to me had a darker robe than the rest. They must have been the Grand Crackers or something of this cult. Each unsheathed a sword. I swear at this point I was literally whimpering and pissing myself out of pure fear. And I mean fear, the kind you feel when you know you're totally anally messed up. Not the kind when you see a UFO or hear something bang against your window at nighttime. Both swords were now resting on my shoulders, crisscrossed in front of my neck. The guys in front of the effigy started singing. You know those bullshit humming noises that are really cliché in these surreal situations. The one guy in the middle then stood up, pulled another match out, and lit the effigy on fire. It started to burn and lit some of the room up. Just enough to see the rest of the freaks in their state of worship. Now, here's where you're really not gonna believe me, but I'll prove this. After I completely emptied my bladder from fear, I heard two extremely loud bang noises from behind and became totally disoriented again. I heard an extremely loud piecing noise in both ears. White all over. I was so out of it. After slightly regaining vision, I saw small beams of light in the room, then more dark figures. I could make out an S on one of them, but I was still dazed by whatever just happened. I thought I was dead again, that the two people made their move and chopped my head off for an owl, but this was far from what happened. I felt someone behind me now, fiddling with my hands. I thought it was one of the cult guys taking me to Moloch, but it was a SWAT team. I was so confused and figured that I passed out from the stress and I was dreaming. When they pulled the tape from my mouth, I started yelling uncontrollably again. I was yelling so much that I was starting to lose consciousness again, then silence. Blackness again. Just total F blackness. Now, after later waking in a hospital, I was told that everything above had actually happened. I didn't believe the people trying to explain it to me until they showed me a news article apparently dated today, which a screenshot of it is here. So, according to a detective, the seven guys in robes are apparently some sort of satanic cult located in Nevada. They were here in Nebraska apparently trying to use Craigslist to capture a person to sacrifice to Moloch. They picked the wrong house to use though. It apparently is a well-known heroin house, but most of the druggies abandoned it some weeks ago. I was in a detached garage on the property, where I was to be sacrificed just before the DEA and state police conducted the drug raid. I'm really thankful to those cops for saving my helpless ass that day. Without them I'd be a headless body inside of a burning owl effigy. Not a fun way to die in a new town. I lived with a guy I met off Craigslist for a few months May-July 2003. A few years later I see he is wanted on TV for the disappearance of a girl. He ends up in jail on charges for failure to register as an ass offender. I went to an organized search looking for the missing girl's body and get interviewed by the Ella Times. They printed that I was his girlfriend. He admits to his part in her death, says she overdosed on heroin at his house, and he threw her body in the ocean because he didn't want to get in trouble for not registering as an ass offender. I don't believe that story. Also, another girl that lived there with me just disappeared. I think he had something to do with that. I've reported her as a missing person to police. First time on Reddit. Can I use names? I don't like searching for jobs, but my parents made me do it. I was 18 and a half years old, with my birthday coming in about six months. My mom and dad used to joke that when I turned 20, I would have to leave. They care about me, but they are very strict. Getting a job would make them happy and make them less strict, so I thought it was a good idea. My dad told me to look for jobs on websites like Facebook, Craigslist, or even in the local newspaper. I chose Craigslist because it seemed easier. Reading a newspaper felt old-fashioned to me. My grandparents used to read newspapers, but now they use tablets. It's funny to see them using tablets. I looked on Craigslist for a job, and after a lot of searching, I found one at a Chinese restaurant. But it wasn't to be a chef or a waitress. It was for a job called a dish hand. I didn't really know what that meant at first, so I clicked on the job ad, and there was a short description. Basically, it was about washing dirty dishes and making them clean and ready to use again. I was a shy 18-year-old girl, so I asked my dad to contact the owner through the Craigslist ad. They had left a name and a phone number. They wanted to know if you had any experience and how old you were. But I told my dad, Isn't it funny that a dish hand job requires experience in washing dishes? He laughed and joked, It's hard work, you know. 
What if you drop and break all the dishes? I didn't think he was really serious, but he seemed like he was. This was going to be my first job, so I felt nervous. My dad called them, and about two days later, we set up a meeting. We went there during the daytime when the restaurant was closed. When we got there, they opened the door for us. There was a lady and a man inside. I think they were married, and they looked like they were in their mid-sixties. They were quite small, maybe around five feet tall. I'm five foot four, so I was much taller than them. They unlocked the door and let my dad and me inside. The restaurant was really nice. It had a lot of decorations, flowers on the walls, and even old Chinese pictures and things. We sat at one of the tables where people usually eat. We started talking, but it was tough to understand their way of speaking. My dad did most of the talking, and I just sat there feeling shy. Sometimes it was awkward because their Chinese accent was really strong. When the man asked me something, I had to say sorry because I couldn't understand him. But I got the job, and as time went on, it became easier to understand them. I'm not sure if it was because I got used to their way of speaking, or because I had been with their family for about a month by then. They were a nice elderly couple. They used to talk to each other in Mandarin, a language I didn't understand. When they spoke to me or asked me to do something, they used simple English with strong accents, but I grew to like the family. They were friendly and treated me well. I know washing dishes isn't a great job, but sometimes you have to start at the bottom, and that's what my dad taught me. I worked for about five to six hours each day. I started in the evening and finished around midnight. Sometimes I began work at 7 p.m., sometimes at 6 p.m., but it was never earlier than 6 p.m. They would call me on my phone when they needed me. Trying to understand them over the phone was even more challenging. Most of the people working there were from the same family, so I felt like I didn't quite fit in like I was different, but still, they were friendly to me. As time passed, a new guy joined our team. I'm not sure if he was a chef, but he started cooking the food right away. I think he had experience because he knew how to cook the dishes really well from the beginning. Maybe he had worked at another Chinese restaurant before. He wasn't Chinese like the others, he was American like me. But there was something strange about him. He didn't talk to anyone much, and he often had a creepy smile on his face. That guy seemed a bit scary, but he also seemed very shy, like he had a really hard time talking to people. The problem with my job as a dishwasher was that I had a lot of free time once I finished washing the dishes. The owner didn't want me to work out in the front of the restaurant, and I definitely couldn't cook the food. Honestly, I wasn't good at cooking anything, not even simple stuff like beans on toast. So after all the dishes were done, I just had to wait. I had a spot next to the sink where I kept the soapy water and suds ready, and I would change it every hour or so, depending on how dirty the water got or how many plates there were to wash. The sink was pretty big, so I had enough space to move things around and put lots of plates and silverware in at once. During my breaks, I stayed in the kitchen. There was a door at the back of the place, but I didn't like going out there. Some of the family members used to go outside to smoke, but I didn't smoke, so I didn't see the point. Instead, on my breaks, I'd stand with my phone and lean against the sink behind me. I usually just looked around and chatted with the family. I became good friends with the owner's son and daughter. They were about the same age as me, maybe 21 or 22. Their English was a lot better, and they went to a high school near mine so I felt like I had more in common with the owner's son and daughter. But this new guy, whose name I still didn't know, never talked to anyone. I didn't understand how the owner hired someone like him. At first, I didn't want to ask, but my curiosity got the better of me after a few days. I ended up asking the owner's son, and he told me that this guy used to work for someone his dad knew, so it was all about connections. The son also mentioned that he had a weird feeling about the guy, and that he hardly spoke to anyone. I could see why they hired him though. He was really good at cooking super fast, and his dishes were even better than the old chef's and the one who was still working there. One day, something really unexpected happened. We opened the restaurant as usual, and I was doing my regular dishwashing job. But then, out of nowhere, there was a lot of coughing and commotion in the front of the restaurant. I didn't pay too much attention to it because I was just a dishwasher, not a waiter, chef, or owner, but it got so noisy out there. It seemed like more than five people were coughing and struggling to breathe. I couldn't help but stop what I was doing and take a closer look. I walked past the kitchen, and that guy just kept on cooking as if he couldn't hear any of it. I knew he could hear it, but I could tell he didn't care. 
So I walked closer, and I saw something that really shocked me. The owner, his wife, and their two sons and daughters were gathered around a group of people who were struggling to breathe. They looked more scared than I had ever seen them before. The son rushed back and grabbed the phone, the one that was connected to the building. He called 911 and told them that people were having a bad reaction to the food. When the ambulance and medics arrived, things calmed down a bit, but the people who were choking had to go to the hospital. Throughout the whole situation, I was scared. I was genuinely afraid that these people might die. It was really uncomfortable because everyone else in the restaurant stopped eating their food. Half of the people in the restaurant left, and the others stayed but were pretending to help the choking people. Every employee of the restaurant was worried. They were either nearby watching or trying to help, except for one person, the guy who was cooking. At this point, no new orders were coming in because the owner had closed the restaurant. I remember him turning the closed sign on the door, but the guy in the kitchen just kept on cooking. Even when the medics, paramedics, and ambulances arrived, he didn't look up once. I noticed him still there, cooking like a robot. He showed no emotions and didn't seem to care about what was happening at all. So, to me, this raised serious suspicions. After everything was sorted out, the owner closed the restaurant for a couple of days and told me not to come in. When they reopened three days later, the chef was gone, he never returned. I asked the owner's son what happened, and he said they had to let him go. They didn't have any proof, but they believed he might have poisoned some of the customers. After this, it was the only logical explanation. It wasn't allergies. Something harmful had been put in the food. He didn't want to talk much about it, and the owner's behavior changed from that day on. He didn't want us to talk while we were working anymore. If he caught us talking, he would yell at us and get really angry. I can't accuse someone without proof, but I have to be honest. I think you'll understand that guy gave off a really unsettling vibe, like he might have been trying to harm people just for the fun of it. When everything happened, he didn't show any emotions, as if he knew it was going to occur. I stayed at that job for a few more months until I got an apprenticeship. Now it's been five years and I have a full-time job, but I still think about this almost every week. One time my roommates and I got on Craigslist because we needed some weed and we were fiending. So my roommate, who is a gay male, helped my other roommate, a straight male, attract another gay man to come over and smoke us out in exchange for sex. The goal was to make sure my straight roommate did not have gay sex that night. The plan was set. I was playing as my straight roommate's sister and our gay roommate was hiding in my room playing stage crew, meaning he was setting up our props for the night and being as quiet as possible. So the man comes over and rolls a blunt. We smoke. He was easily the most irritating person I've ever met. Never stopped talking about things we didn't understand, but he kept on keeping on. Kept taking about people like we knew who they were. We were stoned and watching Netflix, and he just wouldn't stop. Two-thirds into the blunt, my straight roommate says he's done, and the guy we invited over says to just put it out because he's done too. At this point, I text my gay roommate hiding in my bedroom, call in exactly five minutes. Five minutes pass and my phone rings. I had previously saved his number as mom in my phone for the full effect. When I answer the phone, I pretend to freak out. I hang up and tell my straight roommate we have to go to the hospital now. Grandpa has had a stroke. So we run into my bedroom where my gay roommate is hiding in the closet and grab our bags and shoes already prepared for us and apologize to the guy invited over for leaving. He says it's no big deal and he'll catch us next time. Stoned as if we drive in a circle around town, laughing our asses off, and go back home and give the last bit of the blunt to the roommate who hid in the closet. We called it our tower heist. I saw a listing for a Dell Optiplex 380 on Craigslist one time for $25. I've been looking for a nice little computer to stream movies onto my TV from. So I figured that since the guy was local and the price wasn't bad, I would message the guy. I tried haggling the guy down to $20, but he was shockingly firm. Whatever, I just agreed to buy. I asked to meet at our local McDonald's, perhaps five minutes from my house, and he declined I forget the exact excuse, but it had something to do with his car. Being wary of meeting people at their home, I asked if he could have someone drive him to town. No. He said he could only meet in the next 15-20 minutes at his house, 
and he was leaving town for a few weeks, so I needed to give him an answer now. I was getting quite annoyed, and despite my better judgment, I hopped into the car and booked it to his place. When I pulled up the house was normal enough, but obviously hadn't been mowed for the better part of a month. I reluctantly knocked on the door. The guy doesn't let me inside. His brother didn't want me coming in, he says. Apparently this was actually his brother's place. I asked how I was going to test the computer, and he said I couldn't. Funny story, the price also went to $35. I was getting a bit frustrated, so I agreed, threw him $35 and drove home. I tried plugging it in and wiring it up, but was hit by a very strong smell, something I can only describe as old oriental food. Concerned about the computer and mostly curious, I tried unscrewing the side panel, but it wouldn't budge even after I put a ridiculous amount of pressure on it. It was at this point that the acid wore off, and I realized that I was sitting shirtless in my neighbor's driveway, violently pounding a hole through the bottom of a Chinese takeout box with a tire iron. Wanted a hamster. Found free hamsters on Craigslist. Called the phone number and asked, do you still have any hamsters left? The lady replied, oh yeah, I just found some. Did I hear that right? I must have misheard it. When I arrived at her house, there were several cages filled with hamsters. She wasn't an intentional animal hoarder. She started out with two or three hamsters. But one of the hamsters escaped, and it was pregnant. They started breeding in her walls like rodents, and every time she would find one, she would put it in a cage. When I arrived at her house, there were about 100 hamsters in the walls under the couch. Her house was infested with hamsters, she was genuinely overwhelmed and had no idea how to take care of the problem. I gave her the phone number for a small animal rescue. They removed all the hamsters. I adopted two, Peanut and Teeny Bean. Teeny Bean had a massive facial tumor, one black eye, and one white eye he was born without one and his eyeball socket filled with some kind of gel. The vet said these were cosmetic, and he was otherwise fine. He was the ugliest hamster ever, and he loved to snuggle. I went to buy a N64 with a ton of games and a few controllers for 100 bucks. He told me to meet him at a Walmart not far from my school, so I went after the school day. He told me that morning that he had a cherry red Mustang, and to meet him at it at 3 o'clock. I pulled into the Walmart, and there has to be three or four cop cars around a cherry red Mustang. The guy was sitting on the curb while they took out a bunch of shit from his car. He had like two pounds of marijuana on him and some other stuff. I was sad. I really wanted the N64. Yes, I foolishly let a strange guy come to my house to buy a used iPad. I advertised on Craigslist for his son. He handed me 40 bucks less in cash than I asked in my ad, saying it was all the cash he had, and that he figured it was a fair price. When I refused to accept what he offered, he became irate, red in the face, slapped my table with his palm, said I was being greedy, and that everyone selling on Craigslist negotiates their asking price. I tried to calm him down by saying that I had only had the ad in for one day, and I would be glad to call him if I couldn't sell it for my asking price. He angrily decided he still wanted it, and left to go to his bank to get the 40 bucks, slamming my door behind him so hard that the house shook. As soon as he left, I texted him not to come back, because I had changed my mind about selling the iPad after all. He texted me back apologizing, but I never responded. I felt really relieved that I got him out of my house, and also really stupid for allowing him to come in. Not terribly wrong, but my girlfriend and I arranged to buy a couch off of a couple in a fairly bad neighborhood. After a hassle of trying to find the place we get in the apartment, the couch is in really good condition, and it was retail listed for $2,200, we were paying $500. They were moving the next day and really needed to sell it. As I'm carrying one of the sections of the couch out with the guy, I see a bug scuttle across the couch. The guy flicks it off with a quickness, and looks at me with the most apprehensive stare ever. Long story short, the couch was absolutely infested with roaches, like I'm talking thousands inside the couch. They knew.
I love ferrets and I was in the market for a pair. I owned one when I was younger, I always check Kajiji for people who bought a new pet and ended up in over their head. I know shelter animals are still being fed. I saw the perfect post. Free to a good home, got daughter ferrets, doesn't like them cause they bite. Figured they would still be trainable, and the pickup was in a nice part of town. I get to the house, and it's a big nice house. So far so good. The lady invites me in and says the ferrets are downstairs. I get inside, and it's just wall to wall of toys. Her ten-year-old daughter comes round the corner, and it's unbelievable how similar her daughter looks like Veruca Salt in the original Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie. It doesn't surprise me how much she acts like the kid in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory at all. She starts screaming and hitting her mom for trying to get rid of the ferrets. The mom doesn't even notice her daughter punching her. Then I notice all the animals in the house. There's like a billion hamster cages I see from the walk to the front door to the basement. They are all stuffed with bunnies and guinea pigs and hedgehogs and gerbils and hamsters and degues and chinchillas. It's obvious that this spoiled brat got a pet every time she went to a pet store, and the retarded parents just assumed they all go in hamster cages and eat pellets. I get to the basement and there's four budgies flying around loose, and then there's a dog kennel. The lady said the ferrets were in the dog kennel. There were five ferrets in the dog kennel. Apparently they had bought her the whole litter before figuring out that they were so bitty. She was trying to give me five ferrets in a shit-covered dog kennel. None of them were vaccinated for rabies or distemperment. I declined and left the house through the reptile room full of poor animals without heat lamps and immediately called animal services. I can't believe people like that exist. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.